Hello. I want to talk through different ways that I have had things shipped to me and shipped things out and about into the world. Ways that have gone really, really well and ways that it has gone terribly. So this is to help a friend tip things. So we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> do, do, do. Yeah, I'm going to start. I'll start with this guy because this is a pretty good one. So this is a packing envelope, if you will, that a group made and then shipped to me out of France. And it arrived here in fantastic condition. Uh, it was like an 1800s print. So when those bend, uh, it's not exactly like they're making any more of them. And it's nice to, to get them in good shape. What the seller did here is something that I've really come to like and that I find more and more places do. They've got a heavy piece of cardboard, and then they've taped, I'm not going to show the front because it's got my address on it, a piece of paper on the front, and basically made their own cardboard box that's nice and flat and fits flat through mailing sorters, but doesn't want to bend. It's a little bit of give, but not like a ton, not enough to make me worried. A little bit of give, but not a ton, and it'll ship just fine and safely. What really helps this work out is they put in front of the plate, or in front of the print, a piece of heavy, thick, okay, just bent on me there, but a thick piece of cardboard um, that made it all the way from France to here in the US just fine. Without that piece of heavy cardboard, though, um, this starts to flex real easy. So, things that work great here heavy ish piece of cardboard and a front thicker solid piece. So sandwiching. Sandwiching is the takeaway from this. Because when you don't sandwich, or you don't really even use any cardboard, and especially on prints, you're essentially shipping two pieces of paper. And mailmen love to just crumple those up and shove them into mailboxes. And I have two prints over there that are being sat on by other books to flatten them out. So yeah, cardboard sandwich, sandwich your books. Um, speaking of books, this one just arrived. Uh, it is a fantastic um, mid 1800s uh, Mexican Spanish sword and military system. I had the envelope it came in and I have no idea what I did with it. But the seller put a wonderful thick piece of cardboard on the back and then basically suctioned, it felt like, the top of the envelope to it. No room whatsoever for it. The book was wrapped in a piece of plastic as well to make sure that it was nicely trapped onto the cardboard. So I'm going to get more into plastic wrapping in a second, but that insurance of making sure the book and the cardboard were essentially one giant piece definitively helped this arrive safely. Um, I would have very much so preferred another piece on the front, especially to protect it from like bangs and bumps against any of the conveyors or other things. And you can definitely tell there's been a couple dings, especially at the corners where it came off line and hit. Um, you can tell that the cardboard itself, because the cardboard is cut larger than the book, um, <laughs> You can, you can see the cardboard upturned on every single corner, right? This whole side has been squished up. Uh, this one as well. So having the cardboard be larger than the book definitively saved the book from a lot of the damage it would have taken on its journey. So what we've learned so far, sandwich things <laughs> between things that are more sturdy and make them slightly larger than what you're sandwiching. So the other example I showed, the top piece was not, that little piece of cardboard was not larger than the surface area, yes, of the thing it was squishing. Always try to make the sandwich larger. And that's how like sandwiching works, right? Your bread wants to be larger than the entire part, so otherwise it all just falls apart. Same concept for packing and shipping flat things. 
Um, and of course you're wondering then, what happens if the item I want to ship is large? Um, that's when we get into the territory of make our own packages out of poster board. But notice this, I can't actually bend this one, wonderfully thick, heavy piece of paper uh, poster board. And this otherwise floppy print that I got, uh, that's French, also out of France. <laughs> if, it's, if it's written in France, in French, it's a safe bet to safe bet that it's out of France. So, um, giant, thick, heavy piece of cardboard definitively saves this print. But you can actually kind of see a little bit on this corner how it's dented in. That's because this one, the cardboard is cut to almost exactly the same size as the print. Um, it's actually part of what makes it so hard to fit back in this sleeve and uh, why it won't be going all the way back in. So, um, if you have to, make your own stuff. Cardboard is a wonderfully cheap building material and it will save 90-ish percent of packages and fit them to size. Other alternatives that you might be tempted to use that, oh, there we go, I honestly don't recommend. Um, Mostly, mostly from experience on having received packages from them. Wood and trying to build a crate. Um, one, it's expensive. It's like prohibitively expensive to build a wooden crate to ship things. Oh my goodness. Um, not this one, but a different model uh, saber. But close enough to a nice, thick, heavy, large cavalry saber like this one. Um, the guy charged me like 60, 80 bucks in shipping. Like, <laughs> it was like, the sword was not that expensive. It was like half the price of the antique sword, right? And shipping costs to get me it because he wanted to build a, a crate for it, which I thought was like, oh yeah, man, sure, cool, go for it, go for it. And that was a terrible decision. Not only did the crate like quadruple my shipping expense first off, to like triple my time waiting on the well he built the crate for the sword but the crate didn't even survive shipping and in fact damaged the sword in transit because unlike cardboard which has some flex and some give to it and can be like squished around what you're trying to ship with it a very hard immobile item like wood where the item in question is not like bolted down onto it, gives it the chance to wiggle and move. And what ended up happening in shipping is with even the wooden crate, um, these things are like a thousand grams, right? So a kilogram, um, 2.2 pounds. And that's just the sword, that's not counting the scabbard. So add on like half that. That's a lot of weight sometimes to be like slung out of an airplane or by a shipping dude. And what ended up happening was the sword shook so much in transit, it busted part of the wood, wedged itself underneath part of the container, and ended up both bending the scabbard, putting a ding in it, and bending the sword in the scabbard. <sighs> Ever since I've been vehemently opposed to shipping in wooden boxes. I think they have their place if done properly, but there's so many better options. <laughs> so I don't, I don't propone at them. Okay. We went really large here because I wanted to go through different materials, but I'm gonna, gonna put that aside for a second. Okay, so cardboard, fantastic. Saves prints. Saves books, it's great, 10 out of 10. Uh, here's another example where the print was, I still honestly keep it attached to the, the cardboard, even after I received it a lot of the times, um, because they just work good if I need to put it in a box and take it to uh, a convention or a show or a workshop or a training seminar. They, they hold up really well. And yeah, sure, there's a little bit of flex to it, but it's easy. <laughs> it's really good. Cardboard's great. It's, it's cheap and you always have it. Um, Bum, bum, bum. Fantastic. Okay, now what if you have something that is not flat and you don't want to build a wooden box for it, which you shouldn't build? So let's start tiny. These are 
salesman samples, right? Um, a lot of times you might just also hear people call them letter openers. Kind of depends on uh, on when they're made and for what purpose. Sometimes these are salesman samples. Uh, sometimes they're letter openers. Uh, all the ones I have on my desk right now are actual salesman samples. So like you get ones like this one where they've got your little knot on it, right? How do we keep something like this, which is obviously of, of some historical value, uh, safe in shipping and not completely destroyed? The answer is one, make a cardboard box for it. Right, that's a simple answer. And I think will work for most things. Um, but the problem is this one I think would be just fine with a simple cardboard box. The sword is nice and secured in there in its scabbard. It's pretty good. This one, you're screwed. So, what I recommend for shipping smaller items that are liable to move on their own or possibly be damaged in shipping by something is honestly something that I don't see enough people do for shipping. Um, get some paper towels or uh, a washcloth, preferably one you don't care to ever get back. <laughs> um, tissues I find to be too thin, paper towels work pretty well. Um, tr bags, so I've got a whole bunch of them here for demonstration purposes. Bags work great. They're fluffy and everybody always has like a thousand of them. <laughs> They're great. Um, they're great packing material that you can offload to somebody else to go recycle for you. <laughs> Hacks. So, what I would do with this one is, do I have paper towels located right around me? Because that would make this bleep easy. Ah, uh, bum, bum, bum. No, of course I don't. All right, so, what I would do for this guy is cling wrap. <laughs> Could be any brand. Honestly, I find the cheaper the variety, the better this works. Any part of this that is going to risk being damaged, aka the parts that are going to make contact with the outside, aka the end caps, cushion them. Right, cushion the crap out of them. All right, this is actually what's kind of weird sometimes about shipping is that we don't really care about the middle, um, unless you think somebody's gonna like sit on it, which I feel like sometimes happens more than I would like to know with some of my swords and their shipping experiences. Oh boy, it's a, it's an ugly time. But most of the time, I think we can get away with just the ends, and if you want to feel better, protect the whole thing. But the key parts are the end portions. Um, I'll get into a pair of antique, du uh, antique dueling epes in a second, because I think that makes the point a little bit more clear. Protect the end portions. And come here, cling wrap. Cling wrap it. Honestly, cling wrap is the most underrated shipping material I think that exists. Um, unless you've worked in like warehousing, in which case we use it for, we well, used to, I don't work in there anymore. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> this is really awkward trying to like film and do this at the same time, but hey, we're working through this. There we go. All right. Cling wrap it. Unlike tape, there's no sticky residue, which means it's unwrappable by your client and they don't have to worry about stickiness on the product. It's great. Um, I initially was really worried when I sometimes would open swords or books even wrapped in cling wrap about things like condensation and heat and moisture and all that jazz. Um, that fear has completely disappeared. 
I now almost explicitly request that anything I get shipped get wrapped in cling wrap. Ideally, with the book technique, or the book, with the cardboard technique that we talked about, where it's sandwiched. So what I would love to do on this is properly build out like a pair of cardboard end caps that keep both sides of it safe and then pad it around it and then cling wrapped around that. And that's just all keeping it secured in place. So that way in transit, even if the outside box, because we're going to get into that in a second, even if the outside box gets zinged, this, if it has just enough room to bounce around, remember the horror story of the sword in a box, a wooden box one? Even if it has enough room to bounce around, this will make sure that it has internal additional padding and can survive that bounce. Note, if you have a product that goes inside of another product, aka a tiny sword and a tiny scabbard, do not, do not wrap and then place that in something else. I have an antique officer sword in the other room that I'm going to have to pour like half a jug of acetone down because there's a cling wrap wrapping that went around. Somebody shipped, we shipped, wrapped around the blade, shoved in the scabbard, and then it's just shoved in the scabbard. And I can't get it out. So that's a do not with cling wrap or really any packaging material, packaging material for that matter. If what you're trying to protect has a gap or has an opening and you're trying to fill it, do not fill it with something the same size or larger than what you're trying to fill. like. Yes, do not fill it with something the same size or larger. So in this case, the cling wrap is like, expands to be larger than the scabbard which means like when it fluffs out and gets stretched it, it expands to be larger which means i can't get it out so i'm gonna have to dissolve it out um, and it's a pain for me as a customer um, and I, I really risk potentially damaging um, something that's irreplaceable right so not a great time don't do that <laughs> instead Fill it with something, if you have to, fill it with something that is smaller than the opening and will stay smaller than the opening and is super easy to remove. A plus. Um, sawdust. Packaging peanuts. Packaging peanuts exist for a reason. Um, and most of them now are actually like water soluble. It's fantastic, right? So packaging peanuts. Great. Um, ba -ba -bum. Paper, newspaper, bags, as long as they won't poof out and be larger than the thing they're going in. Um, something that won't bounce around and cause damage. So like if you're shipping antique glasses or bottles, uh, don't put ball bearings inside of them. <laughs> I feel like I need to say that aloud. <laughs> Styrofoam beads, though. Cool fills it up, make sure that they're a little bit more filled up and less likely to just crack or be damaged because it has something inside of it. Cool. Good. A plus. Um, again, would be even better. Wrap it with some padding. Box it with cardboard. Saran wrap all of it in place. I'm a massive proponent of, sand, of saran wrapping things in place, cling wrapping things in place. Um, it's super easy to do as a seller. It's super easy for the for the client to unwrap it, and with all of the things I've gotten internationally at this point, I haven't had trouble. Um, probably some of the farthest shipping experiences I've had have been out of like well, literally India is on the other side of the world, 12 hours away, um, 12 and a half to be on which time zone section, and I've had at least one or two tall wars in leather scabbards or sheaths. And no issues. None. It's been great. Um, yeah. Got a sword from Africa the other week. The saran wrap. It's great. Wooden scabbard. No moisture, no condensation, no heat damage. Super great. Um, 
even if it was in the middle of summer. And right now I'm in a weird spring flux, but temperature flux in, sh in shipping, especially coming out of where their climate is, because they're going into fall. Coming out of, yes, <laughs> going into winter. So it's saran wrap. It's great. It's super cheap, too. Bags from the grocery store, saran wrap, cardboard box the outside. For like a couple cents, you can do an entire packaging job. That is super safe. Okay. I talked about dueling epes. What to do for small components that are fragile or very likely to poke through a box or be damaged. So these are uh, 1880s dueling epes. Uh, do, do, do. Matched pair. Dueling epes. They're great. So, I have a maker for anybody that wants to know. Uh, Samuel um, H O P P E. Because I always butcher that pronunciation. Cause I can't remember if it's the British pronunciation or the French pronunciation. So, hey, um, I know the French, but it doesn't mean I know which uh, where the maker's from. So, at least not off the top of my head, not this time. Dueling Epes. Um, That tip is pointy. It's designed to go through someone. Um, yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. So it also means it's going to go straight through a box. And potentially straight through the courier if they're really unlucky. Um, and I really don't want to have to do that paperwork. I just, I don't. I've got other things to do in my day. So the seller I got these from did a fantastic little trick where they put wine corks on the tips and the wine cork has stayed on that tip since i've got it like two or three years ago because they're safe and they're great um bu -bu -bum. will this work for every tiny object uh no works on these because the entire blade is wonderfully sturdy and constructed um, if I had to say, that's, this is a great example, protect the tiny little back portion of this guard, uh, ba -bum. I wouldn't want to use that because it is a wider surface area and it's a larger uh, volume. We're going to pretend those are the words I'm trying to f find right now. There are definitely better words here. I realize that. But those are the words that I'm thinking of right now. And what I'm trying to say here is because it's larger than what I'm trying to protect, it acts as a giant lever and could potentially make it easier to bend or snap this off. Here it works really well, especially because that, that tiny guy it's kind of fragile, or could be, has the potential to be at least. This is pretty darn sturdy. And so even though it increases the surface area of the tip, this is down pretty deep on it and doesn't terribly make it a better lever, um, especially when we look at the overall size of this. So for tiny guys like this, wrapping it with filler material, whether that be bags, napkins, foam, something to essentially make the tiny portion part of the entire piece will mean that you're increasing the amount of contact that it has with everything else. That's not the right series of words in the sentence, but what I'm trying to say here is it reduces the chance of this being acted on by something outside of it as a giant lever. So this right now comes to a point. We want to make it a fat triangle. And by taking it from its current shape and form and turning it into something that is much more sturdy, um, i.e. see Giza and how long they've been going, into something much more sturdy uh, shaped. 
we increased the chances for it surviving. So I would pad with tissues, I would pad with napkin, trash bag, something, and take it from tiny to much more sturdy. Probably do one wrap and saran wrap on that guy. And then cardboard box frame it with more padding on the outside of that. And saran wrap that again in order to kind of make a little... Why would I pick the middle of this? For, I would make this a very awkward shape that would just sandwich this together between some layers of cardboard. Yes, it costs slightly more in shipping costs. Um, because now I'm using two layers of cardboard and some extra grocery bags and some extra saran wrap. Which comes to a grand total of about mm, half a penny. Cool. <laughs> so we're going to do that. Okay. Um, bu -bu -bum. So this is a great example of what I said. Where we don't have to really worry about um, shipping or covering and protecting the middle. Um, especially if we use something. Okay, giant shipping tubes. That keep it safe. This keeps it pretty darn safe. So, this is great. This is fantastic. Here, the end caps were nicely taped, and the ends of each piece were wrapped in dishcloth, hand towel. Uh, I can't remember if that's mine or the seller's. They work, they've been in there for a while. Um, I typically wrap that in tape then. Um, yes, I know tape's not good. Uh, in this case, because I'm redoing it, like undoing it, especially when I go out for workshops or to teach at seminars with these, I use painter's tape. So it's just enough to stick to itself, but not stick to anything else, especially not the pieces inside. Because uh, these are late 1800s, early 17, sorry, late 1700s, early 1800s uh, training foils that still have both of their dyed leather tips on them for scoring touches. So. I rather like that about them, and I like to keep that safe. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Again, keep movement down. And let's see here. I think I have one other piece to show. So, things to not do. Um shoddily make your own box. Why? That's why. <laughs> I'm so sorry to rag on the seller if you recognize your box. Um, but you see that flex? That's because this seller relied on uh, painter's tape to connect two separate sections of box without there being overlap. Um, no, wait, 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 there is a little bit of overlap here. Never mind, I take that back. There is no overlap. That, that shiny part sword right there. So, there's no overlap here, which means it's just going to split apart. This is a weak point. Um, I'm fully expecting there to be a bend in the sword. Other part up here we can tell that they didn't wrap it at all. How can I tell? Because I can feel the guard directly through the cardboard, which means that on every line, every shipping conveyor belt, this would have slammed against that belt through the guard. Um, two, do you hear that rattle? That rattle is our scabbard chain, or not scabbard chain. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, I wrapped that sword, uh, so we can't see it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. This one's got one still. It has a little scabbard ring for attaching to a drag. A uh, drag, uh, attaching to belt, hook. Yes, those words. <laughs> Occasionally know what I'm doing. Tonight, no, evidently not. So. That's not been secured, which instantly tells me they did nothing to wrap or pad the sword whatsoever. It is sword, shoved in a box, and shipped. 
So, how easy is it to, uh, just, like, casually open it? Oh, wow, that was really easy. That was depressingly easy. Okay. Now this one, if I recognize correctly, is a modern reproduction of ones that I typically collect a lot more of. But I sometimes like to get more modern ones because it makes my antiquing life a little less worrisome when I go to conventions or workshops or what have you and I want people to handle pieces and do actions with the originals. And then I just have some ones I don't have to worry loaning out, or lo worry about loaning out, aka non-antiques. I believe that's what this one is. Yes, yes it is. Yeah, so this is a more modern reproduction. But oh, yeah. So it's more modern, which, depending on your stance on this, you might think means more well-made, or at least more likely to survive things. It's like 50-50 in, in the antique community, um, especially the, the antique sword world. Um, I really shouldn't generalize antiquing on this. There's such a broad breadth of them all. Um, but I remember this guy being in pretty darn good shape from the photos. I'm going to initially draw attention to Scabbard and why we don't just ship things in boxes. You see that split? Yeah, that's because the sword would have gotten caught on something and, or pulled out and pulled in because of all the continuous rattling, shaking, and chipping. And it has started to separate the chap from the rest of the scabbard. And... Oof. I don't know how my odds are looking for putting that guy back in there all the way. Oof. Sometimes there is a little bit of a gap, but... I'll need to go back and check the photos to see if that was like that prior. All right, sword itself. Okay, uh, I have like one or two others. Of the, I think I've got at least two of these reproductions, so I'm ish familiar to how they look. I have like 20 of the originals, so I'm really familiar with how those look. Uh, do, do, do. So damage-wise, what else do we have? Dings. All right. Loose in box. Now, I said specifically guard damage is what I was going to expect, because these stick the furthest out, and here we go. It's going to be really hard to see on this camera. Um, I can get this lovely view of my RGB keyboard, though. So, hey, <laughs> get the light show. Um, no, I don't think it's going to come into focus. Okay. The guard has actually been bent down, which means if this was fragile, it would have been snapped off. And this is because... Here, we have a single point of contact that is not supported or rounded or taken from our single point and then widened out and built up upon. Um, and instead is just designed, or well, was <laughs> designed uh, to suffer all of the blunt force trauma of being tossed around and chipping. And we can see on this side as well, uh, a ding on the edge of the scabbard. And the tail actually looks really okay. And that is because the box has two, is it's like wrapped around and that's the heaviest part over here. Um, so I would hope it survives that. And the front, I just don't think it had a chance to make contact with the front of the box. Because, we're all talking about, like, build up and build almost a, a pyramid around the top, of, around the, the weak spots, the spots you want to protect. That's the front of this box, is... Built up, just like that. So, that's this portion right here. That's where the front of the sword is. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> And it was the most safe and secure portion of it. So, that's what we want to do, honestly, around any protruding components that are likely, or almost certainly guaranteed, to be bashed around in shipping. That's what keeps things safe. Um, protecting those parts are what keeps those vulnerable portions safe.
All right, my headset died for a second because I haven't been listening. I've just been talking. Oh, that was super unfortunate. Okay. Oh. And it's a little hard to wiggle in, but it doesn't look like there's any bend to it. So I don't want to place that directly on shipping. That might just be how this one comes. Uh, there's a slight bend to it, but I don't know if that was shipping or like that from, from years prior. So I can't blame that directly on shipping. Um, bu -bu -bum. That being said, we did see our box with that split point as the two boxes met, but there was no overlap to help support and brace each other, which means if at any point in time in shipping, the <laughs> forces moving the guard heavy portion of the sword were placed under any sort of weight or force could potentially be enough to pressure and flex this entire sword, which will in turn bend it. Um, that's just what happens sometimes. So that's where it's very important to have some sort of bracing. I think it's somewhat overkill, but I have seen very successfully, especially for some other longer pieces that I have, especially ones that are maybe a little bit more flexible. Some sellers take a PVC pipe and cut it in half or just leave it whole. And we'll do a layer of paper towels down first, cloth, something, and then wrap the pipe alongside the sword to act as an extra piece of rigidity. Um, and also a little bit of a buffer zone to help keep it from getting bashed around. That's actually worked fantastic and is also a super cheap option. Um, I've also seen scrap wood done. I've seen scrap wood done successfully and very terribly. I've seen scrap wood used successfully the entire length of the piece, and I've seen scrap wood used absolutely horribly when it was just like one or two random pieces directly against the, the item. They scuffed the heck out of it. They didn't save anything, and they were terrible. Whole length? Or, well, a little bit longer even then, too, because the wood and the PVC both took all the blunt impact of the base. It was so nice. Uh, a+. Plus. Uh, other things. So this wiggles. This wiggles. Uh, as we went over with that other piece, some of these have a tendency to just, like, fall out. If anything in a product has a chance to move, either ship them separately... It's option one, which gets costly and no one likes, or figure out attachment points or ways to secure them all together. Uh, again, why I like cling wrap, uh, because you can just cling wrap it all together and you're done in like 30 seconds, like three seconds. Done. Easy. Simple. We're moving on now. Um, failing cling wrap. Uh, I've seen people use uh, yarn twine string etc to attach two pieces together to keep them locked together so they don't move the problem with that is your connection is only as strong as your weakest component if that happens to be a sword bit or whatever else it's connected to um, this will rip apart and will sometimes just hang dangling there sad um, that happens to be the small piece you're connecting it to this will just rip off, and it's dangling in the wind. Um, or it's the string itself, in which case it's all done, because that was your attachment piece. Haven't had that problem yet with cling wrap, because again, it's large surface area. You have to basically cut through it or unravel it, which thankfully just wood doesn't happen in shipping. Works out great. I really just can't recommend cling wrap enough for this. It works out fantastic. For trying to lock together pieces and for trying to pad them and keep them secure in shipping. Okay. Honestly, if I were to do a little bit of a cardboard wrap on this, cling wrap it, and put it in a box, I'd feel 
safe shipping this. As bad of a shipping job as this is, I, I can I can kind of feel this word right here, but a, a cardboard layer around that, be safe, be super safe and fine. Um, ways it wouldn't be safe though, even with all of this wonderful padding. Oh. Dooby -dooby -doo. I'm gonna put it in this giant box. Oh, there's an opening down there. Well, that didn't work at all. <laughs> Is if I put it in. Oh, it hurts to do that because I know what's happening to it. I'm gonna stop now. Putting it in a giant box. See the amount of room for it to bounce around and get damaged in shipping? That's terrible. That will kill this. Um, guaranteed. Nearly guaranteed. No, guaranteed. It'll kill this. Even with heavy padding, um, this will die. Okay, that really hurt to bounce it around like that. I'm going to stop now. So. Pad the heck out of it. Cardboard wraps around, wrap it, pad it. That'll keep it safe. And then whatever box is used for the actual shipping itself, make sure that there is next to no room. So, more grocery bags are fantastic. Uh, funnily enough, these are almost all from a guy that I buy a bunch out of from Florida because they work fantastic. And whatever space these don't take up, he fills in with packaging peanuts. Uh, shout out to the best chipper I've ever had. <laughs> it's fantastic. So I would fill that space with bags, peanuts, etc. There's actually sometimes a little bit of pros going with um, a box that's a little bit oversized compared to the package or compared to the product. And then, like, filling in that gap with peanuts or bags or something else. And that is when it gets squished by something larger than it, which happens a lot. I, I really I don't like to talk about how often it happens, but it, it happens a lot. Um, it happens a lot, a lot. I feel like there's this instinctual want to squish things down into the smaller space, especially when you're a shipping company and space is money. So, recommendations. Find what the largest sized like box is that you can ship at the target price that you're aiming for in terms of shipping, and then make your box that size. Mine is like a millimeter. Honestly, seriously. <laughs> Even if it'll equate to like two inches of excess space around what you're actually shipping in all directions, fill in some peanuts, put in some bags, put your product in, brace it with peanuts and bags around the side, and then just fill it the rest of the way. It'll settle and shift a little bit, but it'll be safe. It will be large enough that when it's hit and smacked by other things, that force will be distributed across the entirety of the surface area of the package, and it'll survive. Most importantly, it'll survive. So, guy out of Florida who ships me a bunch of stuff. Um, unfortunately, not out of the kind of his heart. Uh, I do have to buy them. Um, <laughs> when he ships me things, he ships me them in some of what I would consider the largest boxes for swords that I will I, I have ever gotten shipped. But they're the most pristine pieces that I pull out as a result of it. I, it's fantastic. That extra space means that I can just... I don't have to worry when I watch the delivery driver pull up, chuck the box onto my front driveway and then pull away, because it just, it just kind of smacks... And it's not like that little box that we just unwrapped together, where if that hits, it's basically the guard, this tiny point of contact smashing and guaranteeably causing damage. 
it's this entire large surface area of a box hitting that force getting distributed across the entirety of the box getting applied to all the all the packing peanuts and bags and other packaging material inside that then diffusing that force even more and then what little shockwave is still propelled in finally getting to the internal packaging job around the package and product itself and that layering of protection keeps those swords safe and it keeps the history and everything around them in pristine condition and it's honestly one of the reasons why i keep going back to buy because it's i know i will get the product safely and it's a huge huge reassurance and just feeling of security there so it's been a very long ramble <laughs> around how to ship things <laughs> congratulations if you have stuck around successfully to the very end and uh apologies <laughs> apologies for uh, taking you all on this journey but i hope you found it uh useful for whatever you're shipping and if you do do sword fighting i look forward to hopefully fighting you one day fencing you both i do both i do both all right good luck